Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Wassalatu Wassalam ala Rasulillah with the book of Imam Al Hajjawi, Zad al Mustaqna fi Ikhtisar al Muqna. We've reached by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kitabu Zakah, the book of Zakah pertaining to the variety of issues around the worship Zakah. So after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say Zakah comes after Salat, Kitabu Salat. And there's a munasaba there, there's an appropriate reason for that, which is that generally in the Quran, in many places, you find that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the salah, he goes on and he mentions zakah. For example, in Surah Al Baqarah, wa aqimu salah wa atu zakah. Establish the prayer and give the zakah. So the zakah is a follow one from the prayer. Therefore, the fuqaha, they mention it in general, mostly after salah in their books. So a zakah lughatan tutlaq ala al ma'nayayn. Zakah linguistically it has two meanings. It covers two meanings. The first of them, al lama wa ziyada. Okay, an increase and extra. Growth, nama wa ziyada, an increase. You call zakah zara ida nama wa zada. It's said in Arabic that the pasture has grown, that the farmland has grown if it increases and if the vegetation grows. Okay, a second meaning apart from growth and apart from extra is and it's also given the meaning of purification for Allah says in the Quran for sure the one is successful who has purified it referring to the purification of the soul he purifies his soul from those things which make it uh, impure like sins etc and shirk in the book, the Hanbali book, Kishaf al Qina, the scholars they mentioned that the definition of zakah istilahan, zakah istilahan technically is a ta'abudu lillahi ta'ala bi ikhraj mal khas li ta'afatin khasatin fi waqtin maksus. That technically the meaning is that zakah is ta'abudu lillahi, is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bi ikhraj malin khas by taking out a specific type of wealth, meaning paying a specific type of wealth or a specific amount of wealth to a specific group of people in a specific time. Zakah was first obligatory was first obligatory in a general sense and the command for that was in Mecca. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mu'minun said, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِزَكَاةِ فَائِلُونَ Those who give their zakah. So here no details were given. So zakah was just in general as a command in Mecca. However, in the second year in Hijrah, in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ was revealed to him a variety of different rulings pertaining to zakah from the Nisab and other matters. Question to yourselves, what are some of the benefits for paying zakah? What are the some of the benefits from paying zakah? Barakallahu fiqh ahsan, jazakallahu khair. These are some of the main points. And also we can add to that barakah. As we said, it gives you barakah in your wealth. And for sure you are rewarded for the act of worship because it's something which is obligatory. It's from the completion of your iman. It spreads love amongst the community and it gives the poor their rights. So jazakallahu khair for your input. You're absolutely correct. The one who doesn't pay the zakah due to stinginess, then this person is committing a major sin. And if he's in an Islamic land, then the ruler is to take it from him, yani ijbaran, is to force him to pay the zakah. The one who opposes the, to pay the zakah, he says that zakah is not obligatory for whatever reason, then this person, if he knows the rulings pertaining to zakah, meaning that it is obligatory, or he was brought up in a Muslim country where knowledge was available, then this person will be somebody who's out of the fold of Islam because he's rejecting something which is ma'loom bi darura, okay, is known from the religion as a necessity. The author, he says, tajibu zakah, okay, he's going to talk about that zakah is obligatory with certain conditions. فَقَوْلُهُ tajib. So when he says tajib, it's wajib, it's obligatory. There are so many evidences which pertain and uh, mention that zakah is obligatory from them. We have the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the famous hadith of Mu'ad radiyallahu anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent him to give dawah to the people of the book in Yemen. So after establishing tawheed with them and after establishing the salah with them, then 
it was mentioned to Mu'ad radiyallahu anhu وَأَعْلِمْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ إِفْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُؤْخَدْ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ فَتَرُدْ عَلَىٰ فُقَرَائِهِمْ And teach them, O Mu'ad, and let them know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the sadaqah obligatory upon them. The sadaqah here means not the optional charity, but rather the zakah. Let them know that Allah has made zakah obligatory upon them. This wealth, this zakah will be taken from the rich of them and distributed to the poor of them. فَتَرُدْ عَلَىٰ فُقَرَائِهِمْ so this is a clear evidence that zakah is obligatory. So the author he says, قَوْلُهُ تَجِبُ بِشْرُوطٍ خَمْسَةٍ It's obligatory with five conditions. So if one of these conditions is not there, then the zakah, the payment of the zakah, is not going to be obligatory. So the first of them, he says, حُرِّيَّ That حُرِّيَّ That a person is free and not enslaved. Okay, so the person has to be free and not a slave. Question to yourselves, why is it that the slave doesn't pay zakah? Uh, so the reason that the uh, slave does not pay zakah is that the wealth of the slave is owned by the master. Okay, the slave himself doesn't own any wealth, right? The next of the conditions is Islam, that the person has to be a Muslim. So why is zakah not accepted from a non-Muslim? Question to yourselves. Why is zakah not accepted from a non-Muslim? Very clearly, it's a form of ibadah, and without being uh, submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a Muslim, your ibadah and your intentions are not going to be accepted. The author, he says, as a third condition, وَمِلْكُ nisab, And that the person should have the nisab. And nisab هو القدر الذي رتب شارع وجوب زكاة على بلوغه This nisab is the determination of the amount of wealth that a person should have before zakah becomes obligatory on that, upon that person. So it's a determination of the amount of wealth that a person should have before zakah becomes obligatory on that person. If you reach this amount of wealth in money, then zakah with other conditions will become obligatory upon you. If you do not have that amount of wealth, then zakah is not going to be obligatory upon you. So milk nisab, nisab is a specific amount of wealth that the Sharia has established wherein if somebody has reached that amount of wealth, then zakah will be obligatory upon them. The author he says, wa istiqraruhu, and that there should be istiqrar of that wealth. Istiqrar, as mentioned by other of the ulama in al muqni for example, they said tamam al-mulk, tamam al-mulk, that tamam al-mulk, that the person should have complete ownership of this wealth. Okay, complete ownership of this wealth. And one of the dhabit, one of the controlling uh, rules that give an understanding of what this truly means, is that they say, That the wealth is not going to be such that it can be ruined or you know, uh, removed from the person's um, control, from the person's complete control. So two examples of this that the ulama give, and they give many, from them is al-mukatib. Al-mukatib is a type of slave in times if there is slavery that has agreed with his master that he's going to free himself. So he says to his master that over a period of time I'm going to pay you a certain amount every month. And uh, I'll pay you this amount every month for two years and after that then I will be free. So the issue here is that the mukatib, he it's possible that he will either lose his wealth, right? Or he will say that I don't want to pay you anymore. I don't want to continue with this contract. He has the right as a mukatib, as that type of slave. And therefore it would mean that the master doesn't have to give zakah on that wealth because he didn't receive that wealth. So he didn't have full mulk. He didn't have complete ownership of the wealth. Even though contractually it was agreed between the slave and the master that he would be paid a certain amount of wealth, okay? طيب فالرقيق أردة أن يعجز نفسه ويقول لن أعطي شيئا فيعود رقيقا كما كان as I just explained another example is أجرة البيت is a person a landlord who is renting out his house to a person here the money that is given in terms of the rent zakah is not obligatory upon this money until the rental agreement has been completed for that year why because they say أُجْرُتُ الْبَيْتِ قَبْلَ تَمَامِ الْمُدَّةِ غَيْرُ مُسْتَقِرُ لِأَنَّ مِنَ الْجَائِزِ أَنْ يَنْحَدِمَ الْبَيْتِ وَتَنْفَسَقَ الْإِجَارَةِ Because it's very possible 
that the house can collapse. The house can be ruined for whatever reason. It can catch fire or something of that nature. And therefore, the contract will become void. Therefore, the uh, landlord would have to pay that money back. So zakah is not obligatory upon him in this type of wealth, in, in, in this type of wealth, because it's not tamam al-mulk. It's not complete ownership. So the wealth has to be mustaqir, istiqrar. There has to be tamam al-mulk. Okay? And the next condition which the author he mentions, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, al hawl that there has to be a hawl. A hawl, there has to be a completion of the hawl. A hawl is the lunar year, has to be completed from the time that the wealth reached the level, the nisab, the level whereby zakah is now obligatory upon that wealth. And it had to remain at that level or above for a whole lunar year. Okay? So that's al hawl, that the hawl. That the nisab, which was the wealth, when it reaches a certain level with zakah is obligatory upon it, it has to complete a hawl, which is the lunar year. That wealth had to remain for a whole uni- lunar year in order for the zakah to be obligatory upon the person. If the, if the wealth went below that, then there would be no zakah until again the wealth has reached the nisab and stayed at that level for a year or so. We have the hadith in Ibn Majah and Imam al Qutni and al bayhaqi and Al-Kubra and Shaykh Al-Albani and Sahih Al-Jami'ah Rahim Al-Ta'ala, he said it's authentic. We have the hadith with Aisha radiyallahu anha. She said that the Prophet sallallahu said, لا زكاة في مال حتى يحول عليه الحول. There is no zakah upon wealth until a hawl has passed over that wealth. So once the wealth reaches the nisab, which is the set limit by the sharia, that when wealth reaches this point of money or wealth, then zakah has to be given upon it. And also that wealth has to remain at that level or above for a whole lunar year. Tayyip. The author now, he's going to mention some exceptions from that wealth which requires a hawl. So the type of wealth that he's going to mention now doesn't require a hawl, doesn't require for the whole lunar year to pass on this wealth, okay, for zakah to be paid on it. Rather, once it's reached nisab, it's enough for it to be paid without having remained there for a whole lunar year. So the author, he says, قَوْلُهُ فِي غَيْرِ الْمُعَشِّرِ قَوْلُهُ فِي غَيْرِ الْمُعَشِّرِ المعشر, uh, This mu'ashir is referring to الحبوب والثمار Okay, it's referring to grains which are produced on the land and fruits which are produced on the land. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here about these وَآتُوا حَقَّهُ يَوْمَ حَصَادِهِ And give the rights of this the day upon when you harvest it. So when the grains are harvested and when the fruits are harvested, at that time zakah is obligatory upon them if they reach a certain amount uh, in wealth, a certain amount of grains and a certain amount of fruits. So here there is no hawl. The hawl, the lunar year, doesn't have to be there for this type of wealth. وَإِنَّمَا سُمِّيَةِ الْحُبُّ وَثِيمَارِ مُعَشَّرَاتِ And these uh, grains and these uh, fruits are known as mu'ashar. Why? Because it comes from the word ushr. Because one-tenth is the type, of, is, the, um, is the zakah which is obligatory upon grains and upon wealth. It's either one-tenth or half of one-tenth, okay? Depending upon how the uh, grains and the fruits are watered. So this is why they are known as muhashir. Question to yourselves, with regards to generally we know that money, okay, money based on gold and silver, uh, currencies, uh, the wealth of that type has a, has a nisab of a whole lunar year. But when it comes to these grains and fruits, they don't have a whole lunar year, it's as soon as it's harvested. Why is there this difference? Why is it that when it comes to certain types of wealth, like currency, Okay, and the value of gold and silver and trade goods, for example, uh, the value of trade goods, that here we have to have a complete hawl, a whole lunar year. But with regards to the hubub and the thimar, the grains and the fruit, there's no lunar year. Why do you think there's a differentiation here? So Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi ta'ala, and other scholars, they mentioned that, well, if you look at the thimar, if you look at the fruits and the hubub, uh, once they're harvested, if you were to leave them for a longer period of time, they're not going to increase in their value, they're not going to be invested. Rather, what's going to happen is they're going to start to become rotten, so they will lose their value. 
So here, the nisab, the, the hawl, the lunar year, doesn't benefit that type of wealth. Whereas in other types of wealth, whether it be currency value, or it be stock value, or it be livestock value, here, there can be an increase and a benefit to that wealth if it is given a lunar year. So the author, he mentions, illa nitaj sa'ima, okay? So the first thing he mentioned, which was an exception from the hawl, was the mu'ashr, the, the grains and the fruits. And also an exception from having to have a hawl is nataj asaima. Nataj asaima means the offspring of sa'ima, the offspring of the sa'ima. Wal maqsood bi sa'ima hiya bahimat al-an'am allati tasumu wa tar'a al hawl fil mar'a. And this sa'ima, this word sa'ima is bahimat al-an'am, right? Which grazes in the pasture freely for a year or close to a year. Bahimat al-an'am are those animals which are camel, cows, sheep, and goats, okay? Those animals which are uh, valid to be used in udhiyya, to be used in slaughter. So the offspring of these animals, okay, upon them there is no need for a hawl, for a lunar year to pass. An example to make this clear, inshallah. One has 70 sheep, okay, somebody owns 70 sheep. Now the 70 sheep, if they uh, remain for a whole year, then one sheep is due from that as a payment of zakah. Taib. However, if before, if before the year is complete, the hawl is complete, each of the sheep, they give birth to two more. So now they become 140 sheep, right? So let's say in the 10th month, these 70 sheep, they each give birth to two. Now the owner ends up having 140. So here, two sheep are due. But the owner may say, hang about, the hawl hasn't been complete on these new sheep. Yes, the old sheep, the ones that gave birth, they're about to complete the hawl. But the newborn sheep, which have only been there for two months, the 70 sheep, the newborn sheep, have only been there for two months, so I don't have to pay zakat on them. The fuqaha will say to them, no, because the hawl of the new sheep is connected to the asl. This is what it means by the taj asaima, that the hawl of the new sheep, the newly born sheep, is connected to the asl. Right? So as long as the, as long as the, um, the sheep, which were there originally, reached the level whereby zakat is obligatory upon them and they remain at that level for a year, then anything which is born from them, okay, before the year is, uh, when the year is due for zakat, will also be included in the number. This is what is meant by nataj uh, as saima and the evidence of this at Dalil al Awwal and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can you bathu a suat ila ashabil mawashi for Yahuduna Zakam in al Mawjud Kulhu. Wala yis aluna and mala and ma walada and ma wulida athna al Hawl. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he used to send out the people to collect the zakah, when they would go to the farmers and those who owned the livestock, they would look as a totality at the number of livestock livestock that the owner had and they wouldn't ask which was newly born or which was with you for a year or less than a year rather they would just look at the totality and they would calculate zakah upon that what the little thani and now saha and is a haba rabbi allah and whom and whom can we edge aluna hawl al mawlud min bahimat al alam hawl aslihi and also it's authenticated from the companions of the allah and whom that they would take the offspring of the uh, livestock and include it in the number upon which zakah is obligatory, as mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Khalil in his explanation. Also, as an exception from that whereupon hawl, whereupon the lunar year is not a necessity, is ribh tijara ribh tijara is the profit made from trade. So the author, he says, well, ribh tijara profit made from trade, walaw lam yablug nisaban, even if this profit doesn't reach the level of nisab. فَإِنَّ حَوْلَهُمَا حَوْلُ أَصْلِهِمَا إِنْ كَانَ نِصَابًا For the hawl is based upon the capital investment if it reached the level of nisab. So as long as the capital investment was there for a year, okay, whether or not the profit made from that capital is the level of nisab and remains for a year or not, that is not a consideration. What is a consideration? is that as long as the capital investment was there for a year and it's above the nisab, okay, then whatever profit is made, whether it reaches the nisab or not, is going to be added and connected to the capital when it comes to paying the zakah. For example, one has invested 10,000 pounds in trading 
and after six months a profit of five thousand was made so the ten thousand which is the capital a whole year has passed on that and so zakat is obligatory upon that wherever how however the six months where the five thousand was made that has not been a complete lunar year but the ulama they say because this is ribh tijara because this is profit made from the trade this doesn't have to have a whole year as long as the capital was above the nisab for a whole year then you pay zakat on the whole amount so you would end up paying zakat on the 15,000 even though the haul was only on the 10,000 because the profit the ribh tijara is connected to the asl is connected to the initial investment and he said um, and he said even if the profit didn't reach the nisab so for example the capital investment was above the nisab for a whole year and the profit was only something like five pounds or five riyals in the year a person doesn't know how to trade right he only got five pounds or five riyals in the year so even upon this five pounds or five riyals okay even though it's been with him for only six months and it hasn't reached the level of nisab zakat is still due upon that why because the initial asl the capital investment was above the nisab and it was there for a whole year so ribh tijara profit from trade uh, is connected to its asl is connected to its uh, foundation investment and the author says wa illa famin kamalihi and if the uh, initial capital investment was below the nisab as is the profit below the nisab then obviously zakat is not paid upon it until both of those or one of them reaches the level of nisab okay um, not mentioned in this text but mentioned in other texts by the Hanbali scholars such as Rawd al uh, of Imam Bahuti and others the Hanbali scholars they also mention exceptions to the haul exceptions to having uh, the wealth there for a whole year they say that which is found in the earth that which is ex extracted extracted from the earth min al ma'adin from uh, metals okay so if metals are extracted from the earth and they reach the level of nisab of gold and silver they reach the value of the nisab set for gold and silver then zakat is given upon that once it's extracted and also zakat is given upon honey once the honey is extracted whether it's there for a hawl or not for a hawl and also upon uh, trade goods which we will come to discuss a bit later inshallah the author now he's going to mention a few issues pertaining to debts so he says وَمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ دَيْنٌ Whoever has a debt which is owed to him أو حق من صداق أو or a dowry which is owed to a person وَغَيْرِهِ and other than that أَلَا مَلِيْن owed to him from a person who is able to pay أو غيره or a person who is not able to pay or who refuses to pay أَدَّى زَكَاتَهُ إِذَا قَبَدَهُ لِمَا مَضَى then the person pays the zakah okay on this wealth when it's returned to him okay so when it's returned to the creditor then the zakat is paid on this wealth however if he wants to pay it because he believes that this debt is a good debt that whoever I've given this money to I have trust that this person can pay and will pay that this person is trustworthy then here the person can pay the zakat on this amount of wealth which he has loaned out he can pay yearly however it's not obligatory until the wealth is returned to him so it's not obligatory until the wealth is returned to him so a question on a debt that is owed to you if you are owed 40,000 pounds for example or 40,000 riyals and it's returned to you after 10 years how would you pay the zakat on this how do you work the zakat out on this how do you pay it okay so so what I'm getting to here is that in the first year you would pay the zakat the 1 40th or the 2.5% on the whole amount of 40,000 which is 1,000 pounds or 1,000 riyals right and in the next year it will be now the amount of 39,000 that you would pay the 1 40th on so you don't pay 10 years of zakat on 40,000 for each year rather you allow it to be deducted from each year of those 10 years uh, this was an important point that ulama mentioned and also with regards to this point about paying the zakat when it's returned to you uh, Ibn Taymiyyah he made tafsil 
Tafsir is that he gave extra information and he separated between issues. He said that if the person that is owing you the debt is expected to repay, meaning that it's known that he's trustworthy and he has wealth, then you pay the zakah yearly. But if the person is known to be somebody who's a cheater, a liar, a fraudster, or the person is bankrupt, then on this wealth you don't pay the zakah until you receive it in your hands. Hatta taqbidhu Until you receive it in your hands, as mentioned by Sheikh Mansur Saqib. طيب. The author he says, وَلَا زَكَاةَ فِي مَالٍ مَنْ عَلَيْهِ دَيْنٌ يَنْقُصُوا النصاب. And a person who owes a debt to other people, and this debt, if he pays it, it's going to cause his wealth to go below the nisab, then this person doesn't have to pay zakah. So a person owes money to other people, he's a debtor, he has to pay back a loan, and if he pays this loan, it's going to cause his wealth to drop below the nisab, so this person obviously doesn't have to pay any money on the debt. وَلَا زَكَاةَ فِي مَالٍ مَنْ عَلَيْهِ دَيْنْ يَنْقُصُ نصاب. From the proofs of that is the Athar of uh, Uthman رضي الله عنه collected by Imam Ibn Abi Shayba. He said, هَذَا شَهْرُ زَكَاتِكُمْ This is the month wherein you pay your zakah, meaning the month of Ramadan. فَمَنْ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ دَيْنْ فَلْيَقْضِيهِ ثُمَّ يُزَكِّ بَقِيَةَ أَمْوَالِهِكُمْ That فَمَنْ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ دَيْنْ Whoever has a debt that he owes فَلْيَقْضِيهِ Then go ahead and pay that debt. Take that out of your money. وَزَكُّ بَقِيَةَ أَمْوَالِكُمْ And then pay zakah on the wealth which is left over. Okay, in your possession. So again, the author is saying that if you have a debt that you owe to people, that amount of money can be excluded from your wealth before you pay the zakah. And if it's a case that your zakah, that, your, that when you pay this debt, your nisab will drop, you will go below the nisab, then of course you do not have to pay zakah. The ulama they mention here, they say that zakah of course is there to help the poor and the needy. And somebody who is in true debt is from the poor and the needy. So they are counted from those who actually need uh, to benefit from the zakah, so they shouldn't pay the zakah. And also they say if we obligate, if we make it obligatory upon the debtor, the one who's paying back the loan, to give zakah, and also the creditor, when he receives the money, he has to pay zakah on it, this is of no sense and is not found in the sharia. So only the creditor, when he receives the money, he is to pay the zakah, not the one who owes the money. The one who owes the money, he is not to pay zakah on that amount, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The author he says, وَلَوْ كَانَ الْمَالِ ظَاهِرًا Even if the money is ظاهر, apparent. And the word here, low, used by the fuqaha many times, it's used to indicate there is, that there is a difference of opinion found in this matter. So that's why the author, he mentioned the word low. He said, وَلَوْ كَانَ الْمَالِ ظَاهِرًا Even if there is, even if the wealth is ظَاهِرًا so wealth is divided into two types when it comes to zakah. We have wealth, uh, mal al-zahir and mal al-batin. Mal al-zahir, ta'rif, ta'rifuha, its definition, hi al-amwal allati la yumkin ikhfa'uha. It is the type of wealth that you are unable to hide from the, hides, from the eyes of the people. Wata'adaduha, wata'adaduha, and its enumeration is a zuru, is a and he, you know, um, stuff that the farmer grows, plantation, right, from grains, etc. Wathimar uh, and the fruits, wal mawashi and the livestock. So these 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 three things: azru, which is the plantation, athimar, the fruits, and al mawashi. And al mal al batin and the mal which is hidden is he al mal al yumkinu ikhfa'uha. It is the wealth which you are able to hide from the people. But ta'addaduha and its enumeration is a dhahab wal fiddha is gold and silver wa urud tijara and trade goods. And trade goods. But there's a question here. Trade goods can't, can't people not see the trade goods? So what do the ulama mean here when they say that the, the trade goods is amwal al batina is wealth which is hidden. How can trade goods be wealth which is hidden though you can see it? It's hidden wealth because it's referring to the qima, it's referring to the value, not to the physical goods itself. The value itself is hidden from the people. What is the value of this trade stock? Okay, that's why it's still considered as al-amwal al-batina. 
So here, the author, he said that uh, even if the debt, even if the wealth w from which the debt is going to be given is zahir, is apparent wealth, even then, okay, there's no zakah on it. What does the author say next? He says, وَكَفَارَةٌ كَدَّيْنَ And the paying of a kafara is to be treated like the dain. Meaning that before you pay your zakah on your wealth, if there's a kafara upon you which requires you to spend money, then you would pay that kafara first before you pay uh, the wealth. وَالْكَفَارَةُ كَدَّيْنَ فِي كَوْنِهَا تَنْقُصُ نِصَابِ لِأَنَّهَا دَيْنَ لكن الدَّيْنَ هُوَ الله. The, the one who is loaning the, the one who the wealth is owed to is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Bukhari. A woman came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and she said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a mother who made a vow to make hajj. Can I make hajj on her behalf? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, don't you see that if there was a debt that your mother owed, would you not pay that debt? She said, yes, of course, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah azza wa jal, Allah, fallahu ahaqqu bil wafa. Pay the debts to Allah, for Allah is more deserving that debts are paid to him. Okay, so any type of kafara, any type of expiation which requires you to spend money, that is to be done. That is to pay. That is to be paid before you would work out your zakah. The author he says, وَإِن مَلَكَ نِصَابًا صِغَارًا إِنْ عَقَدَ حَوْلُهُ هِنَ مَلَكَهُ If a person has livestock which is young of age. If a person has livestock which is of young age, then this are going to be also part of the hawl, part of the uh, wealth which is um, given the lunar year as, uh, from the time that he has ownership of them. So what he's saying here in essence that it doesn't matter with regards to the behemoth al-an'am. It doesn't matter with regards to the livestock what age they are. By virtue of the fact that you have them in possession, okay, in your possession, then the hawl, then the lunar year, the counting of the lunar year will start from the time that you have them in your possession. Okay? However, a zakah is not to be given from them. They, be, they are to be included in the number of zakatable livestock, but you do not give the young in the form of zakah. Okay? Um, also, a point to mention here is that if the uh, livestock, this young livestock, is at such a young age where it's only relying upon the mother's milk, then they are not to be encountered, they are not to be included, not to be included in the zakatable livestock. Why? Why would we exempt that livestock which is still taken from its mother's milk? Why would we exempt them from being counted from the number of the zakatable livestock? Okay, because uh, we mentioned earlier that uh, the behemoth al an'am, okay, zakat is upon them. Uh, zakat is upon them if they are uh, yar al, if they are um, what's the word I'm looking for if they are grazing in free pastures okay if they are grazing in free pastures then zakat is upon them if they graze for a year or close to a year however here we're saying that if the if the uh, livestock of the young age is still taken from its mother's milk then this is not going to be sa'ima this is not going to be behemoth al-an'am as-sa'ima. It's not going to be from those that are doing sawm, that are doing grazing in the pastures, right? So then zakat would not be obligatory upon them because they're not grazing uh, in the pastures. طيب, the author now, may Allah have mercy upon him, he's going to mention some issues where the hawl, where the lunar year will be broken and the hawl, the lunar year, the counting of the wealth the, the lunar year upon that wealth will start again. He's going to mention, mention some issues pertaining to that. So the author, he says, وَإِن نَقَصَ النِّصَابِ فِي بَعْضِ الْحَوْلِ Obviously, if the nisab goes below the fixed, what the Sharia has determined as being zakatable wealth limits, if it goes below that, then there will be no zakat due on that type of wealth, right? So for example, if we say that uh, from five camels and above, there is one sheep which is owed. So by the end of the year, if the camels go down to four, one of them died for whatever reason, then of course, the hawl, the nisab is below uh, now, the, the, what the sharia has set, which was five camels, one sheep, 
So now they've gone down to four, that means there's no more zakah. And when the person does get a fifth camel again, then the year will start from the time he gets that fifth camel again. Okay? So if it was in the 11th month and the, the fifth camel died, then the whole, then the year is broken and it starts again from the time he gets that zakatable wealth once again and it remains with him for a whole year. That's what the author means by what in nisab fi ba'dil hawl. Or if he sells uh, this wealth or part of it, which then reduces it uh, below the nisab, below the zakatable amount. Or he exchanges it, uh, or he exchanges that wealth for another type of wealth, which is not from the same type of wealth. Okay, I'll give an example of that in a minute. Or exchanges the wealth for another type of wealth, which is not from the same type of wealth. And this is not done in order to escape zakah in qatal hawl. Then the hawl, then the lunar year is broken and it has to start again once uh, the wealth is uh, gotten again at the nisab level. So the first thing the author he said, Okay, the first thing that if the nisab goes below the hawl. So if a person has 40,000 pounds and in the 10th month, he gives sadaqah. He gives sadaqah of 39,800 pounds, for example. He's only left with 200 pounds. So here now that the, the, the wealth has gone below the nisab, and therefore the hawl, the lunar year has broken. So in the 11th month of that year, he again gets another 50,000 pounds. So here now the wealth is again above the nisab. It's at this point that the lunar year starts for him in his calculation of the year of zakah. So when that wealth remains above the nisab for a year, that's when he pays the zakah. If it goes below the nisab, then the lunar year is broken in terms of calculating what is due for, for uh, zakah. The, the author, he said, أوبعه, or he sells his wealth, okay? Meaning to say the person has five camels as a second thing that breaks the hole. He has five camels and in the 10th month, he sells one of the camels. He ends up only with four camels now. So the hawl and the, the hawl is broken due to the fact that the nisab is now under uh, the limit which the sharia set, which was five for camels. And the third thing which breaks the hawl, he exchanges the wealth for something which is not from the same type of wealth. An example of this is that a person has uh, a, a, an amount of camels and he exchanges and he swaps those camels for a grocery shop because he wants to go into trade. So now here, because he exchanged his wealth with wealth which was different, of a d complete different type, then the hawl, it now starts again. And the author, he said, لا فرارا من الزكاة As long as this is not done to escape paying the zakā. Okay? So an example of somebody who would do that to uh, escape paying the zakā. A person has a million riyals and he knows that it's going to be a lot of zakā upon a million riyals and his iman sadly is weak so he goes to his friend that has a huge pen of camels or a stable of camels whatever you call it a pen of camels he says to his friend i'm going to give you the million riyals uh, before the zakatable year is complete and you give me your camels because we know that the ulama they say if people make an exchange of their wealth which is not from the same type then the hawl of the year is broken. It has to start again, the zakatable year. So he said, let's do this, and therefore we don't have to pay his zakah. But the fuqaha will say to him, no, you did this firaran min zakah. You did this to escape the zakah. Therefore, nu'amiluka naqid qastika. We're going to treat you with the opposite of what your intention was. Your intention was to escape from the zakah, and we're going to ensure that you pay the zakah. So what your trick doesn't work in this situation. So the last point the author mentioned is to exchange wealth of different types. If the wealth is of different types and you exchange it, then this is going to break the hawl as long as it's not done to escape paying zakah. Now there are exceptions from this. There are exceptions from the rule that if you exchange wealth, okay, which is of different types, then it will not break the hawl. The hawl remains and it's not broken. From that is urud at tijara from that is the trade goods. So for example, if somebody is trading in cars and then he decides that he wants to now trade in boats, this is not going to break the hawl. As long as the value of those trade goods remained above the nisab, okay, which is determined by the value of gold and silver, if they remained above the nisab for a year, no matter what the goods were, 
what's the what's the cost the, the the cost the objective is the value of the goods so as long as the value of the goods remained above the nisab for a year then zakah is going to be due upon that wealth it doesn't matter whether the, what, what they were exchanged for so this person exchanged his trade of cars for trading in boats it doesn't matter as long as the value was above for a year and also included in that is the exchanging of gold and silver and this was mentioned by the ulama sheikh ahmed khalil Shaykh Khalid Mushayqih, Rahimahafidhum Allah, and others. The author he says, وَإِنْ أَبْدَلَهُ بِجِنْسِهِ بَنَ عَلَى حَوْلِهِ And if the person exchanges wealth for wealth, like for like, then the hawl, then the, the zakat of year just continues. There's no break in the hawl. Okay, so a person has 30 cows, and before the end of the year, he liked the look of a different type of 30 cows, a different color maybe. Uh, so he took, he exchanged those 30 for his 30 then the hawl the zakat of year continues and is not broken the author he says the author he's saying that zakat is obligatory in the actual wealth itself this is the first part of the phrase that the zakat has to be uh, obligatory from the wealth itself, from the wealth itself, we could say the type of wealth. And it has a connection to his responsibility, meaning that it's upon, it remains in his responsibility until zakat is paid. So this, what the author has done here, he's joined between two schools of thought. So the ulama, some of them, they said that zakat tajibu fi al mal, that zakat is obligatory in the wealth itself so what they mean by this as an example if somebody has 40 sheep right then one sheep is owed uh, as zakat so they're saying that because it's wajib fi al mal because the zakat is wajib from the wealth itself this wealth now cannot be sold okay until one sheep has been paid in zakat because it's obligatory that the, that the zakat is from the wealth itself. This is what it means when they say tajibu a zakat fi al mal. The other group of scholars, they said a zakat wajibatun fi dhimma that rather zakat is obligatory or is connected to the responsibility of the person. That the person, it's upon his neck, it's upon his responsibility that he pays zakat at the value of his wealth regardless if he pays it from the wealth that he has or he sells that and then he pays it from the value of that wealth okay so uh, how Shaykh Uthaymin ta'ala he mentioned this part he said that it's wajib in the dhimma it's wajib upon the responsibility that it's upon the neck is that thus if the wealth was destroyed uh, if this person's wealth was destroyed after the zakah date then the person would still have to pay zakah on it. Okay, that's what it means when they mention wajibatun fi dhimma. So as we mentioned, the author, he joined between these two schools of thought and he made this comprehensive statement where he says, وَتَجِبُ الزَّكَاةِ فِي أَيْنِ الْمَالِ That zakah is obligatory in the wealth itself. وَلَهَا تَعَلَّقٌ بِذِمَّةِ And it has a connection to his responsibility, meaning that it's upon his neck until he pays it. So, Further things that were mentioned by Sheikh Uthaymin in this point was that also from this understanding that if zakah is fi ain mal, then if a person had, for example, 40 sheep and he didn't pay zakah on them, which is one sheep, right? From the 40, one sheep has to be paid. And he didn't pay zakah on them for two years, then he would only have to pay one sheep after he made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though two years had passed, okay? Because this is the, the, the zakah is from the wealth itself so after having paid one sheep then the, then the nisab of those sheep would go down to 39 because it's taken from the wealth itself however if you base it upon the other opinion which is that a zakah wajibun fi dhimma that zakah is upon the responsibility upon the neck of the person okay then it would mean that the person would have to pay two sheep because that's what he owed and that was his responsibility that he should have paid and he should have had to pay too. Uh, I know this is a bit of a technical point and it and it's, uh, needs some thought, but at the end of the day, the ulama, they say, that zakah is wajib from the wealth. Because if that wealth wasn't there, 
then the zakah would not be obligatory wa'id and laha ta'alaqun bi dhimma and also it has a connection to his responsibility fal insan mutalib biha fi dhimmatihi for verily a person is sought to pay the zakah and it's upon his neck it's upon his responsibility until he does so wa ala hadha they say upon this fa idha wajaba tazakah fil mal if it's obligatory in the wealth فيجوز أن يبيع المال وليتصارف. then it's, the person has the freedom to go ahead and to do what he wants with his wealth, uh, to exchange it uh, and to do what he wants with his wealth. لكن يضمن الزكاة. however he has to ensure that he pays the zakah for that wealth uh, once it had reached the nisab and stayed there for a year. and also they say ولو كان عنده أربع شات فليلزمه فليلزمه أن يخرج شات. so if the person had forty sheep, then it would have been obligatory for him. To give one sheep. However, it didn't have to be from the flock of sheep that was with him, right? Because maybe he's so in love with those sheep, he doesn't want to give zakah. But rather, what he did, the value of that zakah, he bought a sheep from another place and he gave that in zakah. So that is also permissible. Uh, an exception from wajib fi ayn al man, an exception from the zakah being obligatory from the type of wealth that you have, is urud tijara. Is trade stock because a person who trades in the commodity for example of sugar he cannot now say for zakah i'm going to give a certain amount of bags of sugar away as zakah now rather what he has to do he has to give the wealth the 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 um the monetary wealth uh, that is uh, equivalent to what is owed in zakah from his trade goods that's what he has to give away in zakah the author he says it's not a consideration when it comes to the obligation of paying zakah. It's not a consideration, okay, that you are able to pay the zakah. So as long as you have the wealth, as long as you had reached uh, a year whereby you had the wealth at the limit of the nisab, where above that uh, zakah was due upon you, whether or not you could pay that wealth, you could pay the zakah or not, is not a consideration. Rather, it's now upon you to pay the zakah and it's going to remain in your dhimma, it's going to remain upon your neck as a responsibility until you pay it. And nor is it consideration in paying the zakah that the wealth remains. So if a year had passed on that wealth and then the wealth was destroyed for every reason, that doesn't affect the fact that now zakah is still upon you to pay. So a further example. So a person may have wealth, but for whatever reason, his bank is not operating for a month or so. Something may have gone wrong with the bank system. He's unable to get the bank to the bank. He's un unable to get to his wealth. But by the fact, by virtue of the fact that his nisab was there for a year, right? His wealth was there at the nisab and above for a year. Then the, the, the zakah now is in his dhimma, is upon his neck, upon his responsibility. He has to pay that wealth whenever he can get to it. Okay? And also, if the wealth is destroyed, whether so he has livestock uh, of camels, for example, which was at the value of the nisab, which is five camels. Let's say, for example, one sheep is due upon the five camels. So after the year had passed, that livestock, it ran away. Whether it was due to his fault for not closing the pen properly, uh, maybe he left it open or not due to his fault. The livestock escaped, right? Or they died of a disease or whatever after a year had passed. So regardless of that fact, whether the wealth had remained or not, by virtue of the fact that he had the, the zakatable wealth for a year, that means he still has to pay zakat. Okay? وَقَالُوا الدَّلِيلِ قِيَاسًا عَلَى سَأَلِ الْإِبَادَاتِ They said the evidence for this is qiyas, analogy, upon the rest of the acts of worship. فَإِنَّ الصَّوْمْ يَجْبُ عَلَى الْمَرِيدِ وَإِنْ كَانَ لَا يَسْتَطِعْ For verily, fasting, for example, is upon the person, right? who is sick even though he's unable to do it so at the time he is sick he's unable to fast but as soon as he becomes uh, cured he then has to make up the fast they say likewise qiyas is made for zakah in the situations that i mentioned ibn qudama imam ibn qudama al-maqtasi rahimahullah ta'ala he said if it wasn't if the wealth was lost not due to the negligence of the uh, owner of that wealth then there's no zakah upon it. There's no zakah in his dhimma. Okay? So the person, he didn't delay paying the zakah. He didn't uh, cause his wealth due to his carelessness to be lost. Then, according to Imam Ibn Qadamah from the Hanbalis, he said that there's no uh, zakah in his dhimma 
in this situation. The author, he says, was zakatu kaddaini fit tarika. That zakat is to be treated like a debt when it comes to the wealth of the um, inheritance, the wealth of the uh, deceased, right? So before, فَلَا يُوَزَّعُوا الْمَالِ عَلَى الْوَرِثَةِ بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ So that the wealth is not distributed as inheritance, okay, until that debt which is owed is paid. So the debt which is owed, as zakat, again, sorry, forgive me. As zakat kaddaini fi tarika. Zakat is to be treated like a debt when it comes to inheritance. So this zakat is a debt which is owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So before the wealth is distributed amongst the inheritors, the zakat amount has to be paid uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the rest of the wealth will be distributed amongst the inheritors. This is where we'll stop today, inshallah. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mistakes and shortcomings from myself and shaitan. I ask Allah that he gives us understanding and he makes us from those that find it easy to implement what we learn. If you have any questions on what we have taken, then feel free. If not, we will continue in the future weeks by Allah's permission, inshallah.